How does science combine with art and creativity? We're here in Indianapolis, Indiana at the Indianapolis Museum of Art to check out two amazing exhibits that overview everything from x-ray technology to the history of paint. You gotta follow me and check this out. Dr. Gregory Smith, I am so excited to go in this exhibit. So tell me more about the chemistry of color. So you put this together then. Uh, there's a group of us that put together a show that really tries to bring together art and science and talk about how the demands of artists and fashion and designers uh, drove scientists to make new discoveries in color and how these discoveries in science and chemistry, some of them serendipitous, ultimately led to materials that have benefited the arts. Whoa, this is gonna be fascinating. Let's, can we go get started? Let's go. Let's do it, follow us. So can you please just kind of take us through what are we looking at and this is, is it a timeline? It's a timeline. We tell this as a chronology that starts here in the Neolithic period and will bring you right up to today. Wow, okay, so I, I, this got kind of this last go picture going on here. What are we looking at? That's right, so we're starting at the very beginning with sort of prehistoric use of color. People have always wanted bright colors to try and represent their world or decorate their objects. So we're starting here at uh, going way back to 270,000 BC. And primarily in that time period, the colors are coming from rocks and minerals that would be ground up. So we're dealing with the iron earths, the ochres and umbers. So these are the uh, iron rich clay materials that have colors like red and yellow, browns and greens. And then these would be dug up, crushed to create the pigments. And here you see an ancient Chinese vessel that has this deep maroon red pigment, which is an iron oxide pigment. We have examples of the raw material here. You can see that the rocks on this side have that deep deep red color. These are hematite, okay. so they're, they're loaded with iron oxides. And then just the addition of moisture, of water, creates a different mineral, uh, gertite and limonite, which are the yellow ochres. And so even at those early time periods, people were doing chemistry. They found that if they took the yellow rock, they could roast it over a fire, drive off that moisture, and generate the red material. No way. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, so what are we looking at now? Well, we're looking at ancient Egypt. So we've got an Egyptian mummy mask here, and you can see that deep blue coloration of the mask. That's a pigment called Egyptian blue. So blue has always been one of those favorite colors of artists, and yet nature doesn't give you a lot of blue things to use as pigment. So early on, people were wanting to make blue pigments, and way back in 3000 BCE, the first purely synthetic artist material was Egyptian blue. You can see some examples of these lumps of Egyptian blue here that I made in the laboratory. Egyptian blue is made in a furnace, so the early chemist would have mixed together sand and embalming salts and chalk and a source of copper, either copper shavings or a copper mineral. This gets ground up, put into a furnace, cooked at this super high temperature for 10 hours, 100 hours, and what comes out are these blue lumps of a glassy frit called Egyptian blue. You can grind this up into pigment and then use it for decoration. And so we've got a video here which is actually taking you through that process of producing the pigment, grinding it up, and making an egg temper paint. So I see we got like a tapestry on this one and a lot of red. So what are we looking at here? This is a Baluchi rug, uh, nomadic people of uh, Afghanistan. And uh, we, we often think about where does color come from and people will guess, you know, it's extracted from plants or maybe it's ground up stones. But what if I told you that we get color from animals, that we can squeeze color from an animal? Sounds gross. But, <laughs> <laughs> but this is an example. This is the dye, carmen, which is extracted from the cochineal in so this is a small beetle which infests Whoa. cacti in the American Southwest and South America. And inside this bug is produced a deep red dye called carminic acid. And that gives us the red color of your Persian carpets and things of that sort. It's a very ancient colorant. And we've got a video here which shows how you can extract that from the bugs and use it to dye cloth, to dye uh, fibers for weaving. Oh, wow. I mean, that was my next question is who, who thought to squeeze? I mean, this bug could barely fit on the tip of my finger. So how did they ever figure out that the power of that dye? Well, uh, you can simply on a cactus, if you were to try to brush these things off, your hand would become stained with red as you damaged the insect. So I think this is a pretty clear instance of where it would become obvious that something special about this little bug. 
Okay, so what are we what are we at here now? Well, if you thought the bug juice was unusual, what if I told you that you can get color from urine? Bizarre. <laughs> yes. So this is the pigment Indian yellow, which has uh, always been said to have been manufactured from cow urine. The cows being fed a diet of exclusively mango leaves. No and kidding. So this urine would be dried down. You can see a ball of Indian yellow, a historic ball of Indian yellow. And here you see it being used in this Indian miniature painting, this manuscript. So all of the bright yellows and in fact, even the green. The green is a mixture of Indian yellow and indigo, which is the dye that's in your blue jeans. Wow. This has an unusual property that under a black light, it glows this very bright yellow, intense yellow color. And so it's very easy for us to identify it in our collection with something as simple as a black light. Tell me about this. This is a great painting by the artist Charles Laval. It's called Going to Market Brittany, and it highlights one of the colors that I really love, emerald green. So emerald green was discovered in 1814. It was actually an improvement on an earlier pigment from the late 1700s called Shayla's green. Shayla was a well-known chemist. For instance, he discovered oxygen and chlorine. Really? He also made this brilliant green pigment, which was really beneficial because most of the greens that were available were not very strong or very durable. So unfortunately, his green was a mixture of copper and arsenic. And so it was- Arsenic's bad, as if, right? <laughs> arsenic as a poison. And so even the improvements, the emerald green from 1814, still copper and arsenic. It gives you this very vivid green color. And what's interesting is because it's toxic, it actually had a second use. So if you were manufacturing this bright green pigment, you would sell out of one door to the artists, you would sell out of the other door to exterminators. And so you'll find it marketed as Paris green as a poison for insects and rodents. Oh, wow, so yeah, it was very toxic. Very toxic. All right, so what we're here now, we got black paint? We're talking about black, the color black, and we're talking about a pigment called aniline black. And it's interesting because it's one of our first synthetic organic pigments. And being black is kind of important because historically, if you wanted something black, you really had two options. You burnt something, it could be as pedestrian as uh, burning lamp oil and getting soot black, or as exotic as burning elephant tusk and getting ivory black. Mm. Or if you were dyeing a cloth and you wanted it black, you had to dip it in multiple colors just to get the black. Okay, that makes sense. So this was the first material manufactured in a laboratory, an organic pigment that produced a black color. And importantly, it was formed or synthesized in the fabric itself, which made it very wash fast and very durable. It could also be made into a pigment. Here you see an example of a contemporary Japanese woodblock print, and that very velvety black background is aniline black. But it's not over. We haven't found the perfect black at that point. Blacks continue to be created, including this example, Vanta black, which was discovered in 2014. It's the blackest material on earth and it's made from vertically aligned carbon nanotubes. So it's very uh, high-tech space This is above age. me. <laughs> wow. And what we're showing here is an example of a crumpled bit of aluminum that has been coated with this material. So from the sides, you can see that that's a bendy, foldy bit of aluminum. But when you look at it head on, it looks like a black square. You can't see its no. shape because it's absorbing all the light. It is, yeah, I mean, you think you've seen black as black, but that, yeah, I had no idea it was even curved. Yeah, exactly, and so its uses are in astronomy and defense and military sort of applications. There's in fact only one artist who is licensed to use this particular black pigment. Wow, so you have to have a license to use this. From the company that, that manufactures it, Surrey Nanosystems. Wow, okay, this is amazing. Tell me what we're looking at in this really neat exhibit. Well, here we have a line of test tubes that have been filled with day glow colors. So day glows are these daylight fluorescent materials. So to kind of break that down, they are pigments that not only reflect light and give you color, but anything that they absorb, they will then re-emit as that same reflected color. So you get kind of a double punch of intensity, which yeah. makes them seem abnormally bright for the ambient lighting. Yeah, they almost look like they're, they're lit because they're that intense. They are light bulbs. They are glowing with their own intensity. 
Man, so how would an artist use this? What do you do with this? Well, we have some great examples here. We're not showing the actual artworks because unfortunately, day glow colors, especially historically, were sensitive to uh, light and they would fade over time. But these are examples of objects that are in our collection, the Keith Haring and the Stefano Castronovo painted Sprouse jacket. So you can see just how attention grabbing those colors are, just how vivid they are. And of course, around town, uh, you're gonna be familiar with day glow as the color of advertising. So it really catches people atten people's attention when these billboards are glowing or signs are glowing, product labels are glowing with that intensity. Yeah, I had no idea. So though, so you literally, they, they grind this up then to make it into different applications? Well, they're unusual as pigments too, because and unlike the minerals and the other things that we've been talking about, these are actually dyes that are impregnated into a piece of plastic and then the sheet of plastic is ground up in a mill to form a fine powder. That's your pigment. Wow, wow. I had no idea that's where that came from. Okay, Dr. Greg, thank you so much for what you guys are doing at the museum here. Um, this exhibit is amazing. Thank you so much. It was great, great having you here. Hey, did you know that subscribing to our channel is one of the most epic things you can do? That's right, subscribe now, share our episodes so that we can actually make more of these things. I'm not gonna lie, I love showing you where creativity and innovation are happening. Get on board and be outrageous.